Welcome to the Miniatures Paintbrush. Today we're going to paint up a Vorvor Laka from Reaper Miniatures. Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be painting up this Volvo Laka. I'm starting up with Minotaur Charred Stone. Before that, I primered this miniature with Rustoleum's Camouflage Green. And I usually I usually primer my miniatures and Reaper Bones indicates that you don't really have to prime the miniatures. Now, I like priming them anyway only because when I prime a miniature, it shows me where the mold lines are, things that I've missed. Because once you've painted a miniature and you already have the mold lines there, it kind of you kind of have to commit to it. Unless you shoot some primer in there, really look it over, make sure there are no mold lines before you continue. And mold lines effectively make a realistic paint job look unrealistic and cartoonish. Alrighty, so now it's all primered up again, and it has a base coat, and then I have concrete slab using Minotaur's um, line of paint. Now, I jump back and forth throughout the paint lines, so I'm not really married to one paint. If something has a color that I'm looking for, then I will use that color, no matter what range or line it is. Um, uh, provided that, you know, I do have some requirements when it comes to paint. And that is that the pigment needs to be pretty dense for what I need it for. And, you know, if it can thin down, uh, I don't like, you know, craft paints where it's not really finely pigmented and then it's all over the place. And if I can shoot it through an airbrush, that, that does help. Another thing that I like. So great color, good pigment and you know quality paint if you are a quality paint i don't care what range you are i i would like you in my collection so this way i can use you as a resource to be able to create now you know that being said the quality of the miniature that i'm painting also uh is very important to me um and that's because if i'm not enjoying a build then and if i'm not enjoying the process then I kind of just rush through it and get it done and then get it over with and not care about it like whatever I can just give it away <laughs> I just got it out of my sight it's an unpainted mini and then now it's, it has a paint job and that's all I care about so mm. <laughs> this one I kind of liked I like the design of it I know it was simple there wasn't a lot, a lot of mold lines to get rid of and I had a vision for it which really really helped out plus there weren't too many colors now the hardest part here were the wings and doing the bones but um, that wasn't really a problem at all once I had an idea and I played around with color I didn't look at any references usually I do but this time I didn't and I'm going to do some Xanatho highlighting, which I did there. I went from a darker to a lighter, and now I'm using a snow light just to get some hot spots. And all I'm doing is uh, choosing what direction the light is coming from, and then highlighting accordingly. And that's called Xanatho highlighting. Usually I highlight from the top. It doesn't have to be the, from the top. It can be, you can decide where the light is coming from and then adjust it to what your needs, however that is or whatever that is. But I do like the contrast that it creates within the miniature. I do like having that as my base. Now, I do want to speak a little bit uh, about, first off, uh, my infatuation with vampires, but and also the Reaper Bones um, series as well. And, you know, when it comes to vampires, um, there's a lot of things that attracted me to vampires, all because the lore is just so, so, so uh, rich and so in-depth. And, you know, it's been in cultural in culture for so, so long that, you know, this mysticism of a blood-drinking entity uh, frightens people and has always been in lore. And that 
that in and of itself is kind of enticing that we've had this uh, in our history, and it becomes part of our history for so long. Uh, infatuation with blood drinkers, living you know unnaturally long lives, pretty amazing. Switching over to some strong tone from War uh, Army Painter, and I'm going to do the wings right there. So as I'm toning it up, and yes, I'm shooting it through, I'm shooting a strong tone through the airbrush. You can do that to get a glaze there. Um, so a vampire in and of itself, and I want to know why they call it the Vorvorlaka as well, because I'm probably saying that wrong. It just seems intriguing to me. Basically what I'm going to do with this miniature right now is I'm just going to build up the tonality of the wings and create a gradient and a contrast. I'm going to go back and forth and I'm going to show you how to do that. We're trying not to get too, too much on the body itself because that I wanted to, to stand out differently from the wings. So a vampire is a being from folklore that uh, subsists on feeding on life essence or blood uh, to continue living. And vampires were undead beings that often visited loved ones and caused mischief or deaths in the neighborhood that they inhabited when they were alive. They wore shrouds and were often described as bloated and ruddy of darkness and consonants, uh, concert, concert sense, um, markedly different from today's gaunt pale vampire uh, which all, which actually our version dates from the 19th century, uh, going all the way up to you know twinkly twilight kind of vampires. So there's a lot of different ways uh, it's interpreted, but the basis form is drinking someone's life essence and or blood, or usually blood. Now, vampiric entities have been recorded in almost in most all cultures. So there is a version in most all cultures. Uh, the term vampire, previously uh, an arcane subject, was popularized in the West in the 19th century after an influx of vampire superstition into the Western Europe uh, from areas where vampire legends were frequent, such as you know Balkans on, and Eastern Europe. Local variants were also uh, given different names, such as Shitigra and Albania and Vyalorkas, which sounds like Volvorlokas, and I think that's where they got this name from. And they would call that in Greece, um, this name, and Sto Strogoli in Romani Romania, and I am chopping that up, and I'm just doing some research on vampires here to bring, to bring that to you. Uh, I figure it was fitting since I am painting a vampire there. Um, this increased level of superstition in Europe led to mass hysteria and in some cases resulted in corpses being stalked and people being accused of vampirism. So it, it reminds me of the Salem witch trials here in America where we just accuse people of being a witch. I think people were accusing people of being a vampire and just causing mass hysteria. And everybody knows that when somebody's afraid, they make poor decisions. Now, here in modern times, though, the vampire is generally held to be fictitious, uh, or a fictitious entity. Although, belief in similar vampiric creatures, such as the chupacabra, which was present in um, Mexico, still persists in some cultures. Uh, early folk belief in vampires had sometimes been ascribed to the ignorance of the body's process of decomposition after death, and how people in pre-industrial societies tied these rationales uh, or creating the figure of the vampire to explain the my uh, mysterious deaths. Um, so... The charismatic and sophisticated vampire of modern fiction was born in 1819 with the publication of Vampire by John Polador, Poladori. And the story was highly successful and arguably the most influential vampire work of the early 19th century. Brian Stoker in 1897 uh, in the novel Dracula, is remembered as the quintessential 
vampire novel and provided the basis of modern vampire legend. The success of this book spawned the distinctive vampire genre. Still as popular to the 21st century with the books and films and television shows, the vampire since have become a dominant figure in horror genre, and I will spare you from any more. <laughs> but, you know, there are, I mean, when it comes to, when it comes to vampires in modern society, though, um, there, and, and coming to miniature games, there is a vampire, there is a vampire, the masquerade, which is a game that you can actually play. Uh, it's a role-playing game. Uh, and it's been an influential um, upon modern vampire fiction and elements of its terminology, such as uh, Embrace the Sire, appearing in contemporary fiction and popular video games about vampire, including Castlevania, which is an extension of the original Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula, and the Legacy of Cain series, actually. Um, which is absolutely amazing on PlayStation 1. Yes, I'm that old. Um, but yeah, I'm telling you, Volforlakas, I guess that's how it's pronounced. I'm probably butchering that. This actually came from the Kickstarter set. Reaper Bones is an extension, a graveyard expansion set uh, that I bought. And I'm painting up that box and everything that's in that box. I guess that's my, my little mission to be able to speed paint throughout all those things in the boxes and get them out of um, out of the way, get them done. And that is a mission because, you know, I, I kind of want to make progress on these Reaper Bones and I, I, I actually back the Kickstarter for... And I know it's coming not to next year, but the year after that. But in those two years, I really, really, really want to get all the miniatures that I have from the Kickstarter 3 painted. So I have two years to do that. So, you know, the heat is on. I'm trying to get as much done as possible for uh, campaigns that I may want to throw, uh, have, um, and I'm preparing to be a crafting DM, but in doing so, I want to be prepared. So I have two years to prepare, in my opinion, for pretty much the ultimate DM experience. Something like that. Or at least be a prepared DM. Now what I used to use is miniatures from the D uh, Dungeons & Dragons line that came, it was collectible, it was random, and I bought like cases of cases of stuff. All those miniatures I donated to a local DM that I knew that was going to use it for their campaign, and I appreciated that they, they worked so hard to um, with me in my game because you know when I made an error when it came to the rules, they would pull me to the side at the end of the game. It's like, you know, the rule says this. And I'm like, oh, my bad, but we played through anyway. House rules, you know, if we mess up the rules, we keep playing, you know, fake it till we make it, I guess. Alrighty, so right now I'm doing is just uh, darking up with some Serpent Sepia onto the floor of the miniature there, just trying to distinct it from uh, the Agrax Earthshade and the darker tones and the, the dark tone that I put up on the wings. And I just want to distinct the floor from the wings. I don't want the look. I don't want the wings just to look muddy, and and that's it. And you know that would stink. So. I think that putting the sepia on the floor and definitely helps with that transition. And so far it's coming out really well in my opinion. Um, there are certain things like uh, the wings I wanted to dark up just a little more and just add a different color to it. It, it just seemed too um, transparent and too light. And I wanted the transition to be, have a little more contrast and to be a little more thicker. So, Plus, I wanted to unify the whole thing. So a little Seraphon Sepia is coming up in there, um, but just very, very lightly, just so you can add that, that color transition to it and using the same no, color. Because when you're painting miniatures, you, you kind of want everything to be unified within your space that you're creating. So you use the colors over and over again throughout. 
Here I made a mistake. You see that little ball spot I just wiped off? I didn't wait for the paint to completely dry before I, I touched it. And, you know, mistakes like that happen. And I'm going to teach you how to get rid of that mistake in just a bit. First, I try to cover it. But that doesn't work. So, well, I'll show you step by step on how I do that. For now, I'm just continuing blending, just getting that, uh, that sepia in, creating that transition throughout the wings. And this is the thing, sometimes when you miniature painting, accidents happen, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the road for you. Absolutely not. You can always, and without stripping and repainting, you can always touch something up. And there, there are ways in which you can touch something up, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. I'm gonna make that pretty seamless uh, in, in a bit, and I'm not gonna cover it up with a different color or anything like that, um, but I'll show you what I do. But before I start doing that, I do want to talk a little, not about vampires, I should continue, hey? Um, yeah, I just want to talk a little about uh, the Kickstarter whole program, because I think that it's just amazing. Ever since Kickstarter 1 came out, it was been, it's been quite the success. It is one of the most funded Kickstarters on Kickstarter itself. Definitely uh, something to behold, the, the Reaper Bones. Okay, so here I am, starting with the base color, and I'm hitting it with a brush, building that up. And the more, most important thing when you're covering this and you're going through stages like you've done before, uh, is you allow it to dry. So what I'm doing is just allowing a little bit of coverage, painting the top over again and just going through the process that I did to get the original color for the rest of the wing. So there it is, just lightly getting that on. It's really important that you have even strokes here too. Uh, you do want to fill in the little ball spot that you created, but I do extend, since when you lift the brush up from the original point and it comes back up, it's going to deposit the most uh, paint right there. So I kind of just, if you look at the brush strokes, it's going straight across right there. Very slow, easy, and controlled. So this way it doesn't leave any brush lines. And you don't want to keep doing that because then it starts drying and you could pull up more paint. But there it is. There's the patch. So I waited for it to dry, and that's one of the most important things you can do, is allow it to dry. Uh, and then I'm going to go with that strong tone, just like we did before with the rest of the model. And and this is essentially how you touch stuff up. You start when you touch things up and you make a mistake. You want to replicate the process that you did before. So this way, when you're done, it looks exactly the same. But the again, the most important thing you can do here is allow the layer before it to dry. Because if you do not allow the layer before it to dry, it there there is an issue. So hitting it with the uh, I'm not too worried. Um, I'm pretty controlled with the airbrush right now, and it's taken years to be that way, but I'm pretty confident and controlled with the airbrush that I'm really not gonna get the paint anywhere else because I'm angling it in a way that it shouldn't hit anywhere else but the spot that I want to hit. And I'm putting the PSI down way low. Uh, I think it's 10, 11 PSI uh, pressure, and I'm keeping the nozzle a decent ways away so I can generally build up, generally build up that tone. You see that dark tone right there? Just keeping it ever so lightly building that area up without putting too much on at the same time. And if you want a, an easy transition with an airbrush, that is key. As you can see right there, it's starting to look really good, really good, really. Mm, look at that. Almost... I guess seamless because I really don't see where I took it off. And of course, if you go one end, you want to do the other one because whenever you're dealing with items of symmetry, one end has to equal the other one. So painting the actual other side is part of the process of covering up. So when you look at it, you're looking at both wing tips and you're comparing them. And if they look equal, then you've done it right. So letting it dry once again, 
definitely key. Okay, time to add some bone white to the bones that are coming out for the wings. So speaking about bones, yeah, that Kickstarter, since Bones won, has been one of the most funded projects on Kickstarter, period, which is astounding. Like, even if you don't play with little plastic monsters, the Bones campaign warrants notice. It is a force, a company to, to be reckoned with, a force to be reckoned with on Kickstarter. Um, so Reaper Bones is a company that stands behind the Bones products as shown, and it's proof that you really don't need high-tech product to make millions on Kickstarter, just high-intensity fan base and a killer strategy. And unlike uh, many, many fledgling startups on uh, Kickstarter, Reaper started in 1992, and over the past two decades have produced hundreds of products scattered over multiple dozen brands, and they found the winner of the Bones line. They found the winner with the bone line, Bones line, absolutely, um, which launched in March. Uh, and for the first one, it launched in, uh, launched in March, quickly became the bestseller within uh, 20 low-cost figures, and Bones didn't guarantee its growth. Though, as the new model designs are expensive to produce, a Reaper founder, Ed Pug, explains that a figure mold for the current piece is uh, already in productions have ranged from $8,000 to $32,000 each mold for each miniature to make each miniature. Each miniature. Um, a dragon mold, however, might begin at $25,000, but can easily raise up to $75,000 depending on the decisions that you make. So molds when producing these things are super expensive. So when you're investing that much, it's prohibitive design cost. With such prohibitive design cost, Pew and his team decided to test Bones success by using a Kickstarter to generate the capital large enough for brand new molds. The Reaper team planned the campaign worthy of the finest dungeon master complete with molds of treasures as well. They set their official Kickstarter goal at $30,000, low enough to get the molds made to get a rank uh, highly in the system, which helps generate further attention. Unofficially, however, they aim for loftier targets designed to earn at least a million dollars to take the top spot on Kickstarter's game list, but careful planning, forecasting, sometimes even higher. It was designed with the hopes of raising four million, Pews explained, and a number that came very close to matching by the time the funding ended for the first Kickstarter. Part of what made Bones incredibly effective was the way Bones leveraged the concept of, you know, stretch goals. So every time they made uh, a certain amount of money, they added new things. So new rewards that are unlocked at different funding thresholds. If you pledged at the vampire level at the first one, you get 100 new figures. So if you, if you pledged the $100 mark, you get all the new figures that come in the basic sets. But there are different expansion parts that you can get. Um, even with serious planning and 20 years of experience developing products for an audience, uh, the team at Reaper faced unexpected results. Pew says that he was surprised at how fast he could accelerate uh, even in the last week. The project raised an additional 1.8 million in the final 72 hours. So it is... It is amazing that that this company made so much money doing it because you have uh, cheap models, but not completely cheaply made. Now, the worst part of a uh, Reaper miniature would be bendy weapons, but I did a video on that, and I did a video on how to just cut them out and replace them with you know regular weapons. Now, the granted, you'd have to buy weapons, but you know that's the downfall. But the good part of it that weapons for miniatures are relatively cheap and you can get them.
You can get them 3D printed. You can get them online at Shapeways. Uh, you can get them from you know current lines, uh, weapons from other miniatures that have extended weapons on sprue. And weapons are fairly easy to come by as a miniature painter if you're buying in bulk, especially. The Kickstarter 3 actually came with weapons that people knew that bendy weapons were an issue. And if that's an issue, it could be a non-issue if you just convert them. Now, converting sounds scary. I know because I was scared to convert myself, but I've converted a lot, uh, well, two, <laughs> I can't say a lot. I converted two miniatures so far, uh, and they were super easy. I mean, really, I have no idea what I was scared of, but I was indeed scared. So if the only thing that's preventing you from getting miniature, getting into Reaper miniatures, Bones Line, is the bendy swords you know fear not because it's really not a big deal to replace them so i'm really happy with the bones and i never thought i would be i was actually very very pensive about getting bones because i've heard some things like in the bones one starter set that i don't know if they changed their, their their formula or something like that that it was a pain and i knew that sometimes when you primed it rattle can that it would become tacky and never cure completely even if you wash the miniature uh, and that's why they say, you know, you don't have to put primer onto the model, but I don't know. I do. Uh, I never had a problem with air and airbrush and uh, primering things with Steinol Res, which I use for my primarily for priming items. Um, yeah, Steinol Res seems the way to go when it comes to that. Um... Uh, this model in itself, great model to paint. I was actually nervous to paint this guy. I don't know why. I figured, oh man, I'm going to botch this one up because how in the world am I going to paint this? How am I going to paint the wings and stuff like that? And usually what I do is I'll go on Pinterest and you know I'll go on to some of the, some of the uh, YouTubers. Excuse me. Sorry. Some of the YouTubers that are out there that have tutorials and kind of look at what they do, maybe switch the colors up, but you know, use their techniques as best as I can for anything like that. But there was nothing really out there. Uh, I think I saw one picture of a miniature, uh, this miniature painted, and I was like, hmm, I don't know if I want to add so much red into that, you know, and then I just went brown. And it worked, in my opinion. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm really happy with the results. It's a bit unexpected. I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself when I created this. But um, it kind of took a life on its own. And it's starting to do that when I paint miniatures now. It's, they're, they're just starting to take a life of their own where I just look at something and say, well, I could use a little bit of this or could use a little bit of that. But I do like doing that with my own miniatures because, I mean, sky's the limit with me, you know. I, I'm not restricted. If somebody tells me to paint something and gives me color schemes, and the color schemes are, you know, whatever, <laughs> poopy, and uh, I have to do it anyway because they asked me to do it, then, you know, I'm not really enjoying myself, you know. And then afterwards, you know, they tell me things like, well, I don't like it that color, and, and those are the colors you gave me, so I don't know what to do. You know, it's like, I don't know. I just spent like six to nine hours working on a mini and um, this is what you asked for. I didn't agree with it, but you know, customer's always right kind of thing. But, you know, hey, you know, other people know better than I do. That's for sure. The thing about when you're painting for somebody else, the best thing that you can do, the absolute best thing that you can do is have that person there with you when you paint selecting the colors that they want on the miniature and they give you an idea step by step of how they want it done this is why i don't commission paint i don't commission paint because people are telling me what to do all the time and my hobby time i don't want to be ordered around so that's that now i may paint these miniatures and put them up for sale one day on a website but that's neither here nor there i mean nobody's telling me how to do these things they're just on the website and you can buy them as is period and that's it 
Now, I like that model a lot better because that gives me creative license to do whatever it is that I want. And I'm not, con uh, not uh, uh, constrained to doing what somebody else wants, which completely limits me and definitely destroys the hobby for me. It just does. Um, so that's why I don't really commission paint at all. I mean, unless you say, hey, Here's this miniature painted however you want, and whatever you get is whatever you get. You know, if I wake up and do a miniature and I'm not happy with it, I'll just get it over with. If I'm in love with the design of a miniature, I might spend, you know, several days working on it, several months working on it until I get it to, because it deserves to be really done right. So that might be something that I want to do. However, if it's like a really poorly made miniature and I get frustrated with it, like, you know, if a miniature is all together and it has a cape and I can't get underneath the cape so it looks like nothing in the back, that frustrates me. I want to be able to get there and to paint the whole miniature and paint the sub-assemblies if I need to. So far with the Reaper miniatures, I have now painted in sub-assemblies with these uh, bones and I think they're coming out really good. I usually leave the base off until the absolute end. I did learn how to, you know, chop off if they are standing on something. Um, I I usually just chop off the bottom piece before I put them onto my own base that I have. So, and I usually do that for the simple reason. Uh, I, I used to paint with those bases that they came with on, and it looked hideous. So, I couldn't have it anymore. I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't. So he is he is shaping up over here and absolutely looking great. And I'm loving it. Now what I need to do with all those white bone pieces, I need to shade them. And since the wings itself are going from light to darker, I need to shade them from dark to lighter. So if I'm going to do the bones, I might as well do the nails and everything else that's going to be white on this or bone white on it. So I'm going to go through the miniature and do that. So this is a Reaper miniatures line. Some people watching my um, watching my videos don't you know only play games workshop games and only knows war game kind of things. Now Reaper Miniatures does have a war game. It's not very, I, I've never seen it played ever. I, I've never even heard it talked about ever. So it was kind of there. Uh, it's Warlords, I believe. I think Cav is their futuristic game. I didn't think it, it picked up a lot of steam. But for those of you who don't know about the Reaper Company, when I grew up painting miniatures, I saw Privateer Press, uh, Reaper Miniatures, and Go, uh, Games Workshop. Those are the three miniature companies that I seen when I went to a store. And um, in the descent from Fantasy Flight Games, but those are game token miniatures, I guess. And they're a little different than these miniatures here, just used for, you know, a uh, D and D and or hobby or war games. So these is the ones I grew up on, and Reaper has been a major for force in my life when I was coming to to paint miniatures. So Reaper Miniatures, if you don't know, is an American manufacturer of pewter and plastic figurines in uh, 25 to 35 millimeter scale, which include fantasy and science fiction figures. Reaper is based in Denton, Texas, which I have to visit one of these days. And he has developed a tabletop miniature game system that may be played with their figures. The Reaper miniatures mascot is a succubus named Sophie, which the golden Sophie is the ward for Sophie, which I would love to get one, one day. Oh my gosh, it would be amazing. So a little history on Reaper Miniatures. Reaper Miniatures started in Fort Worth, Texas uh, in 1992. Initially, two lines of miniatures were produced, uh, distinguished flying collectibles, a line of World War II aircraft, and Renaissance Dreams, a line of fantasy jewelry. I do have to admit that I love World War II aircraft planes, so it would be interesting to look at what one of those looked like. 
So, but Reaper moved to Louisville uh, in 1993, um, and at this location, they reactivated some old miniature lines that the company owned and combined them to the Dungeon Dweller 25 millimeter uh, fantasy line. Reaper saw further growth and need for expansion in 1994 and moved to a warehouse in Louisville, which is really, really large. Late in 1995, uh, they launched the Sky Counter series of collectible card games, accessories, with, uh, and over 500,000 have been sold worldwide. The Dark Haven 25mm Fantasy line was launched in 1996, and it is the top-selling fantasy role-playing game miniature line in the world. So people playing D&D and other RPGs, this is where they get their figures. Reaper also has expanded into European market through a partnership with Miniature Company in England. In 1998, Reaper launched the Warlord 25mm fantasy line and Cav N scale sci fi line combat assault vehicle, that's Cav, uh, Reaper box sets, uh, Reaper Pro paints, Reaper Master Series paints. Uh, in January 2004, Reaper saw. Reaper moved once again to a new facility in Denton, Texas. So they're back to their, their original. The company has uh, four Bones Kickstarter campaigns. These have been used to launch and expand their lines of plastic miniatures in new material. The first ended in August 26, 2012, with the participation pledging over $3 million making it the third highest overall Kickstarter of all time. The second campaign also reached $3 million. And as of the end of 2013, both were among the 10 highest Kickstarters ever. The third, camp uh, the third campaign was the shortest running from July 7th to July 25th in 2015. It raised $2.7 million. Reaper also manufactured two premium acrylic water-based paint line designs for painting miniatures in which they manufacture. So, Reaper has an online community if you ever wanted to reach out from their online forum. Reaper also maintains uh, an on-site research and development facility for their games called The Asylum. And the asylum is open to the public and also serves as sort of a company store offering not only Reaper products, but a wide array of family board games and various role-playing games. And I'm not sure if they closed the asylum, because I have not seen the asylum in a very, very long time. So there are several miniature lines that uh, Reaper produces. As of 2013, Reaper has five major lines of miniature and two minor lines. First, the Dark Havens Legends, primarily suited for fantasy role players. It contains many of, of the models helpful for running role playing campaigns, from models to represent characters and monsters to familiars, weapons, and accessories. This line provides the bulk of miniatures, which are now passed. Uh, 3,000 serial numbers. Warlord Miniature Games. Now, although I have never seen this played and never seen it popularized, the miniatures here look pretty cool, I have to say, and I'd love to paint some of them. Reaper's highly successful skirmish game. When I say highly successful, I've never seen it. Set in Talos. Uh, ten factions fight in the providences for control. The player battles across the world and then log on to Reaper website to report wins and losses, thus allowing a dynamic and evolving world. There's a Reaper Bones, which I'm painting here. It takes 
many of the best miniatures from the Dark Havens line and Cornoscope lines and cast them in plastic as long, along with many new designs, including some too large to produce in metal. Ready to paint right out of the package, they are priced significantly less than more traditional metal miniatures. The Bones line has been funded by several successful Kickstarter crowdfunding campaigns. There's a combat uh, assault vehicle CAV game uh, similar to Battletech. Much like Warlord, players battle across the world and post results online and as 10 fighting companies battle for dominance over six planets, CAV2 is currently being developed. Legendary Encounters is a new line of non-random pre-painted plastics. Uh, the lineup is drawn from existing sculpts in Dark Haven line, with some sculpts from the Warlord line expected to show up soon, and it was introduced in 2007. I never liked the quality of the paint on those, ever. There's Chronoscope which is a line of non-fantasy pewter miniatures in the, dark, in the tradition of Dark Haven's Legend, which was released in 2008. These initial launch consisted of eight miniatures, including some science fiction pieces and a cowgirl. Yes, a cowgirl. The line has since expanded to include additional genres, such as superheroes and espionage, the set also includes a handful of models based on historical figures such as Buffalo Bill, Cody, and classic literary classic uh, characters such as Sherlock Holmes and Zorro. Reich of the Dead, a line of miniatures dedicated to the game of the same name that is currently in development. The game and the miniature line both focus on the alternative World War II in which an alien species called a Croyd possesses, possesses and reanimates German casualties and battle American GIs. Master, uh, Master Series Miniatures, a line dedicated to larger or showpiece miniatures of 10 initial models in the series, 8 have been issued in 54 millimeter scale. There have been previous models as well. But let me take a break from this and tell you what I'm doing here. Now, I'm just fading the bones of the wings going from light at the tip to darker towards the middle. And the reason why I'm doing this is because when I went with the wings, I did it lighter in the middle and then darker at the tips. So I'm just doing reverse order just to give it that contrast and visual interest. So Reaper actually had a couple of different lines. Uh, they had a P95 Heavy Metal, uh, a line featuring reissued miniature from previous pre Reaper product lines, particularly Dark Haven Legends, tas tas casts in 60% lead alloy. Production of this line ceased in February 2013. I remember those. Legend of the Five Rings. Which reminds me of the Legend of the Five Rings card game that's out now. Another miniature line directed and specific role playing setting. The Corrigan setting has Asian flair with samurais and ninjas for characters and enemies. Reaper's license for LR L5R expired in October 2005. Exalted. B, this miniatures, this line of miniatures was made specifically for White Wolf's Exalted RPG. Reaper's license to produce this line expired at the end of 2005 and is no longer in production. There are two paint lines that Reaper puts out. I do not own any of them, but when I was painting, when I started painting in uh, 2001, I only and exclusively used Reaper paints, which are fine. They work. <laughs> they do have a set, I think, of the Master Series of all of them for 600 and something dollars. There is a sale going on 
Uh, so, you know, usually Black Friday yields a lot of great sales. So you may want to look into it if that's what you're into. But they have two paint lines that are produced, the Pro Paints and the Master Series. And, no, actually three. They also have the Bones uh, painting line as well. So if you want more information about uh, Reaper Miniatures, they have their own uh, website at www.reapermini.com. And you can look at all their stuff. But um, Reaper Miniatures, pretty awesome. Pretty awesome indeed. Mm, vampires. Mwahaha. You know, it was fun doing this. It was fun researching vampires. There's so much about the vampire lore that, you know, it's just you don't really get to see all the information about it. Um, and it's interesting that they went with the, the uh, Vialarca uh, uh spelling for this. Because, you know, it is a Nosferatu style uh, of vampire. Nosferatu are hideous. Absolutely hideous. And that's exactly what we have here. Something that's very hideous. I wonder if I could proxy this model for something in the GW line. Okay, time for some intense red. Mmm, intense red. Usually I paint white before I paint the red, but I'm just going to go for it. I figured, you know, I don't want it to be super bright and neon-like. So I'm just going to paint it. And since it has gray in there, it's going to be kind of dulled. So I'm just painting them out. And you can see how I brace my hand onto the pill bottle. And this is the reason why I use pill bottles. And that is because... Yeah, you know, I can brace my hand on it's large enough and I'm clumsy enough to mess things up. So I really use it as a brace to, to be able to do small areas like the eyes or, you know, so on and so forth. And I do it with great effects. I I mean, I it works for me. I know that my hand shakes and I'm clumsy and, you know, coming out with these effects which look cool in my opinion. Just, just me bracing my hands and using these techniques is exactly what I need uh, to be able to be successful. It's funny that uh, vampires have been throughout history, but nobody's ever seen something like this. I mean, this is more like the man bat from, um, from the Batman comics. That's what it seems like to me. You know, there's a lot of fork, uh, folklores surrounding uh, vampires. The notion of vampirism has existed for millennia. In cultures such as the Mesopotamians and Hebrews, ancient Greeks and Romans have tales of demons and spirits which are considered precursors to the modern vampires. Despite the occurrence of vampire-like creatures in these ancient civilizations, the folklore for the, uh, the entity we know today as vampire originates almost exclusively from the 18th century in Southeastern Europe, ver uh, when verbal traditions of many ethnic groups of the region were recorded and published. In most cases, vampires are events of evil beings suicide victims or witches but they can also be created by malevolent spirits possessing a corpse or being bitten by a vampire belief in such legends have become so perverse that in some areas it caused mass hysteria and public executions of people believing that they are a vampire you know, it's, sing it's difficult to make a single definitive description of the folkloric vampire, but there are several elements that are common to many European legends. Um, vampires were usually reported as bloated in their appearance and ruddy and purplish or dark in color, and these characteristics were often attributed to recent drinking of blood. Blood was often seen as seeping from their mouth and nose, and when no 
when no one was seen in its shroud or coffin and its left eye was often open. So sleep with one eye open. It could be clad in linen and shrouded and buried in it with teeth and hair and nails may have grown somewhat, although in general fangs were not a feature. Not a feature. Although vampires were generally described as undead, some folk tales spoke of them as living beings. Can you imagine? I can't. I mean, how do you know if someone in the area uh, is a vampire? Well, there are different ways in which you can identify vampires. Many rituals were used to identify vampires, in fact. One method of finding a vampire's grave involved leading a virgin boy through a graveyard or church grounds on, on a virgin stallion. The horse would supposedly balk at the grave in question, generally a black horse was required, uh, although in Albania it should be white. Holes appearing in the earth over a grave was taken as a sign of vampirism. Corpses, thought to be vampires, were generally described as having healthier appearance than expected, plump and showing little to no signs of decomp decomposition. In some cases, when suspected graves were open, villagers even described the corpses as having fresh blood from the victim all over his face. Evidence that a vampire was active in a given locality included death of cattle, sheep, relatives, or neighbors. Folklore vampires could also make their presence felt by engaging in minor poltergeist-like activities such as hurling stones on the roofs or moving household objects and pressing on people in their sleep. So how do you protect yourself from something like this? Well, items were available to war off revents are common in vampiric lore, like garlic, for example, a branch of a wild rose, a hawthorn plant said to harm vampires, and in Europe, sprinkling mustard seeds on the roof of the house was said to keep them away. Other includes sacred items, for example, a crucifix or rosary or holy water. Vampires are said to be unable to walk on consecrated ground, such as that of churches or temples or across warning water. Although not traditionally regarded as... Uh, as a protection, mirrors have been used to ward off vampires when placed facing outward on um, a door. In some cultures, vampires don't have a reflection, and sometimes do not cast a shadow, perhaps a manifestation of a vampire's lack of a soul. This attribute is not universal. Um, the Greeks, they were the Greek vampires, were able to cast shadows and reflections, but was used by Brian Stoker in Dracula as it remained with popular subsequent authors and filmmakers. Some traditions hold that vampires cannot enter a house unless invited by the owner. After the first invitation, they can come and go as they please. Through folkloric vampires believe that more active that they were more active at night, and they were generally not considered vulnerable to sunlight. There are methods of destroying vampires. Uh, methods of destroying vampires, suspected vampires, varied from staking, the most common cited method, particularly in the southern, southern Slavic cultures. Ash was a, prefer, a preferred wood in Russia and uh, in the Baltic states, uh, or hawthorn in Siberia. With a record of oak in Silesia, Aspen was used for stakes, as it was believed that Christ's cross was made from aspen, aspen branches on the graves uh, purpose, 
proposed that vampires also believed to prevent them from rising at night. Potential vampires were often staked through the heart, through the mount, though the mount was targeted in Russia and northern Germany, and the stomach in northeast Siberia. Piercing the skin of the chest is a way of deflating the bloated vampire. This similar practice to burying sharp objects such as sickles uh, with corpse so that they may penetrate the skin uh, of the bloated sufficiently transforming the revent. One example of later corpses, five people in a graveyard near Polish village in Darkwall, dating back to the 17th to 18th century, was buried with the sickles placed around their necks and across their abdomens. Decapitation. Uh, Roman people drove steel iron needles into the corpse's heart. Uh, further measures include pouring boiling water over the grave uh, in complete incineration of the body. Uh, garlic in the mouth. Uh, there are just so, so many. And, you know, really, really, uh, A, using B baby poop from secret weapons miniatures uh, on that base. And um, I think baby poop, like I used on the secret weapons, is definitely um, something that the vampire would, would be averted to and destroy him. Because, you know, it's baby poop, man. So that's why I put it on the base, so he cannot leave that plinth, hopefully. And he will stay, stay, the good vampire he is in his little miniature world. I mean, I can always hope for the best. If not, you know, I'm going to become a vampire and, you know, it'll be interesting, to say the least. Because, you know, I'll tell you my adventures of miniature painting as a vampire. Which, I mean, in and of itself is not a bad idea. Miniature painting as a vampire, 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 vampire. <laughs> Anywho, I really think that this model is really shaping up, and it just took little light coats here and there. And uh, I am going to put, I am going to put uh, little decorations on the bottom because I don't want to leave it like muddy like. And you know, I'm going to include little leaves. And I'm going to include um, a little bush. Uh, just remember, if you put a bushes down there, you're going to want to, like, shade it with something. You know, you just don't want to leave it that way. Because this way it looks like you painted it somehow. You know, so. And you do want it to match everything uh, that you've created. But I take out my trusty Simply Simons uh, number four flat brush to do my uh, plinths and my... Uh, the bottom of the miniatures uh, base. And I love using this one because it's like a really flat surface and a flat brush. And um, I forgot where I picked it up. I know it was one of those hobby stores, whether it's a Hobby Lobby or it was AC Moore. I think it was one of those two. Possibly Michael's. I doubt it, but I don't know. Uh, I picked up a set of them, and this came in the set. And I'm really happy with that purchase, really. Those and the Nicole brushes that I have, really, really happy. And they, they work really well when it comes to dry brushing, those Nicole brushes. I like those as well. I want to stop your blood. Not really. Not, I, I might, might get some kind of bloodborne disease, and I don't want to do that. In fact, I freak out if there are sharps around here. And anybody who knows it works in a work environment, and I do some safety stuff, knows exactly what sharps are. Yep. Yep, they do. Yep, yep, yippery. Uh, speaking of which, I need to do my safety videos. I haven't done them all. I wonder if it uh, safety videos includes avoid vampires at all costs. That would be awesome. That actually includes that. There's my coffee mug in the back. And it's not really coffee mug. It's a... Um, it's a mug for um, for paint because I don't drink coffee downstairs at all. I really look at the contrast on that thing. I mean, it's pretty cool. I never thought I'd do it. That's why I'm impressed by it. Um, okay, so I'm time for some autumn uh, tufts that I'm going to put on there. Well, one tuff. And I take this tuff and um, I cut it so it's not a complete tuff. I don't think so. I don't think it fit well on there. Because the uh, 
the base is kind of small. So I'm just going to cut this tough in half. Voila. And um, I'm going to stick that on there. And remember, yeah, you, you really should, um, once you stick that on there, not leave it like that. Because then it just doesn't, it doesn't look right. It looks fake. Uh, if you want to unify it, you painted everything else in acrylic paint. The, and, and, you know, shades and stuff like that. Shade it down. Because look at that contrast there. But first things first, make sure that it's nice and exactly where you want it. Because once you put this down, it's a pain to get off, and who wants to move it, right? So there it is. I'm just going to get a bristles on there to stand up as well. And um, let me see if there's any excess that needs to be trimmed, but I don't think so. All right, time for some shade. Again, shade your uh, foliage if you put it onto a a base at the very least and you can also highlight it as well I mean you can dry brush the tips there's nothing against that that you can do um, actually it works really well if you highlight it if not it just seems really dark but I kind of wanted to mute this because this is like a, just a dark piece and I really wanted to go that route uh, at the moment I've never tried dry brushing one of those but you know maybe that's something I want to try because every time I do a miniature I kind of try something new and this is definitely something new for me. Doing um, vampiric wings, I've never done that before. So that's completely new for me. Uh, using the Secret Weapons miniature product, um, also new for me, and so far I like it a lot. Um, using uh, the Intensity stuff uh, from, from Scale 75, I've never used that either. So kind of just like played with it a little bit. And, and again, trying new things is something that I like to do on every single miniature that uh, I do. And, you know, I'm always risk taking and I'm always growing as a painter. And you can't grow unless you're trying new things. It's just the lay of the land the way it is. And I really try to do new things so this way um, it would be much better and behooves me to uh, learn new things so I can get better. So this miniature, I like, I, I really can't. I, I didn't know where I was going with it, and I never used a reference picture. This is just solely for my imagination. I mean, I looked at one picture once, but I didn't stare at it as a reference. Usually I stare at a picture of something in real life. Like if I'm doing an eagle, I will look at pictures of eagles and then say, okay, I want the feathers to look like that or like this. Or, or I'll look at a drawing of something and get the picture of, of how I want something to look or a comic book style or something like that, you know, some kind of drawing or some color pattern so I get an idea. But I really didn't have much to go on with this one. But, you know, I just conceptualized it and went for it, which that is a leap of faith there. Um, okay, it's so just adding these, uh, these leaf litter. And what I do is I put some glue down onto... Uh, onto a napkin or something. I take a tweezers and I dip the leaf foliage into that and then put it onto uh, the base. And I'm using regular white glue, uh, Elmer's glue, or PVA, and it works to a great effect. What I do later also is I shade those things down because I want to, and just the bottoms of each leaf, I put a little bit of Seraphon sepia in there and it really makes the leaves pop. I really do like that. I don't know if I got that on screen, I think I did. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, this is something new I've never done before. Just putting a little bit of shade on the bottom. And it, it really worked well. Like, it really worked well. And there's, like, gradient on those little leaves, which, you know, if you look at them, they really pop on that uh, base there. It's, like, the brightest thing there. So I had to shade them down anyway. So this is just the final step for the miniature, and it will be done I really enjoyed making this, uh, painting this uh, for you, and I hope you found it really helpful. And um, I hope you tune in next time for the next one. And there you go. Don't drink any blood when I'm not looking.
Well, here he is all painted up. I think he came out pretty well. Well, I hope you learned something. I hope you found this video useful. And if you do like it, like, share, and subscribe. And I'll catch you next time on the Miniatures Paintbrush.